So today I want to talk to you about surface plasmons. And the word plasmon um, comes from the Greek word plasma, which means molded or shaped. You might think of the word plastic, right? That makes sense. Um, and the Latin word mons, which means a mountain or body. And maybe by the end of this lecture, the goal is that that, that name will have more meaning after, after we have this lecture. So you might remember that um, from introductory physics, physics 1150, 1151 here, that if you have a conductor, the model for a conductor is an array, a regular array of ions, metallic ions. <clears throat> and then surrounded by that regular array of the ions is a sea of electrons. It's often called the free electron sea, or sometimes called the free electron gas. And what happens is each neutral metal atom will donate an electron or two to the C and then those electrons are free to move around within the conductor okay wherever they'd like within the conductor so those are uh, shared electrons and in sharing their electrons of course the um, the metal ions move themselves closer to the filled shell model um, and this is the mechanism that metals used to bond it's called metallic bonding so that's kind of the classical foundation for it. And then from that classical foundation, of course, it's developed over the years with modern physics and the onset of quantum mechanics um, into a slightly more complex model. So if you remember from your introductory physics class, you might have covered the classical Drude model of the atom or a Drude model of conduction, where it explains what the resistivity of a material is or the conductivity in terms of the density of the electrons per, you know, number of electrons per meter cubed and some other material parameters. Okay. And so this model is relatively successful at certain things, like coming up with sort of a qualitative description of resistance and conduction, but it fails in certain aspects. It, it fails in its specific numerical predictions for the conductivity, and it fails in its specific numer numerical prediction for the heat capacity. So this is a subject that gets covered a lot in modern physics two here, okay? But just to kind of sum up, in case you haven't had modern physics two, or in case you need a refresher, um, since electrons are actually quantum particles, they uh, drew the model of conduction isn't the end all be all with respect to how a conductor behaves. <clears throat> so. There's a whole set of statistics known as Bose-Einstein statistics, named after the two um, men that developed the form of statistics, that explains sort of the rest of the story. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that here. This isn't a lecture on Bose-Einstein statistics, but suffice it to say for now that electrons are quantum particles called fermions, and fermions can't occupy exactly the same quantum state if they're in the same system, okay? So specifically what that would mean, for example, in a hydrogen atom, is that there's four quantum numbers for each electron in a hydrogen atom. There's an energy level N, there's the orbital quantum number L, there's the magnetic quantum number M sub L, and then there's the spin quantum number M sub S. So for the same atom, no two electrons within that atom can have the same set of quantum numbers. Well, that's the same kind of idea um, uh, as you would find here in a sea of conductors. Even though the system is much bigger than a single atom, no two electrons within that system can have the same set of quantum numbers, which means they can't occupy the exact same energy state. Okay. So there's so many electrons in a bulk metal that what happens is these energy states that the electrons are occupying get really, really super close together because they're packed in there so tightly because there are so many electrons. Okay, And because they're packed in so, so tightly, it looks like a continuous function, even though it isn't, even though it's discrete and discretized. The little delta E's in between the energy levels are pretty tiny, and so it looks continuous. Now, within Bose-Einstein statistics, we learn that the electron's highest occupied energy state at absolute zero is called the Fermi energy. And this energy is typically on the order of a few electron volts. For example, for copper, it's seven electron volts or so. Now, if you go above absolute zero, what happens is that this um, distribution function, which has a hard cutoff kind of at the Fermi energy at absolute zero, it kind of gets rounded off um, as you go up in temperature. 
but still the Fermi energy, um, even though it might be slightly below what the max energy is, is still it's a pretty good approximation to what the maximum occupied energy state in the um, conductor is for those electrons. All right. Now you can use the Fermi energy and you can solve for how fast the electrons are moving even at absolute zero. So you just do that by taking the kinetic energy expression, one half m, uh, the mass of the electron times the speed of the electron squared, which is symbolized here with u, speed of the electron is u. So one half m u squared and then you set that equal to the Fermi energy and you solve for your speed. If you do this for copper, for a Fermi energy of 7 electron volts, then you'll get a speed of 1.6 times 10 to the 6 meters per second or so, okay? So like 0.3% the speed of light, and that's even at very, very, very low temperature, 0 Kelvin, which is kind of interesting. Okay, but let's get back to what a surface plasmon is, all right? The free electron gas, as I said in the previous slides, is described by a quantum system. We consider all the electrons within a conductor, um, to a good approximation, to be a member of the same quantum system. The potential that they're obeying is that periodic potential energy established by the metallic ion cores. Okay? So, since it's all subject to the same quantum potential, then they all kind of talk to each other, if you will, and move together and respond to external stimuli as a system. And so what you can think of is a plasmon is actually a quasi-particle. It's a particle, really, that can be described by a collection of interacting particles, in this case the, conductions that, the conduction electrons that make up the free electron gas. And plasmons are going to occur on the surface of the metal. They're quantized. Okay, and what a plasmon is, is a, an oscillation of the electrons within the free electron gas. Okay, sort of a, a collective oscillation though, if you will. All right. So this helps explain a lot of phenomena for metals, but specifically I wanted to talk about the color of nanoparticles today. And so I'd like to first discuss the color of a bulk metal. And one thing that you'll notice, of course, if you look at any metal is that you'll see that it's shiny. And if you polish it so that it's smooth, it's reflective. In fact, it can even be the basis of a mirror, right? A silver background with glass covering it is a mirror, okay? So why are bulk metals so shiny? Why is that a shared common characteristic? The answer comes in a combination of this plasmon effect that we see for the electron, free electron gas in a metal which occurs on the surface, along with how light interacts with that free electron gas. So light is an electromagnetic wave. It's an oscillating electric field with a perpendicular magnetic field. And the strength of the electric field varies in time. Now when the light actually strikes the surface of a metal, that oscillating electric field is going to interact with the conduction electrons that make up the free electron gas. The electric field's oscillatory pattern actually causes a rippling wave pattern in the spatial distribution of the electrons that make up the gas. Okay, so you can see here in this little cartoon at the right, you see the electric field coming in, okay, and that's supposed to be the incident light, which is depicted here in red in the um, view. And then what that does is that oscillating electric field causes the electrons to move around into a specific pattern or arrangement spatially on the surface. Okay. Now, of course, when you have charged particles that have moved around, so the distribution of the surface electrons changes, then that itself is going to generate an electric field. All right. Now, it's important to note that the response of the surface plasmon of the electrons in that free electron gas is going to be a little out of phase with your electromagnetic wave. So it won't be exactly in tune with what the EM wave is doing. And this is kind of like a Lenz's law. It's sort of reminiscent of Lenz's law. So what's going to happen is the wave that's created in that surface plasmon is going to oppose the incident light's electromagnetic wave. And what that does is the energy to form the wave in the plasmon is going to dissipate the energy from the light. And since the energy of that light is then absorbed and dissipated within the metal, then the light can't penetrate the surface, and that's why you can't see through a bulk metal. It's, it's uh, not transparent like glass, instead it's opaque. The oscillating electrons in the plasmon, and then what they do is they re-emit the energy that they have absorbed as the reflected light that you see coming from the metal surface. And that's why metals are shiny reflective surfaces, because the light 
that comes in from the instant electromagnetic wave, okay, is absorbed and then pretty much instantaneously re-emitted or re-emitted on a very short time length. And so it looks like reflection, okay? So that's what happens. Now, you may have remembered from an earlier lecture that metallic nanoparticles like gold can be different colors depending upon the size of the nanoparticle. Now, the reason is this is because the surface, the metallic surface within a nanoparticle, it's very, very, very small, okay? So what you're doing is you're confining the surface plasmon, okay, to a very small surface rather than the bulk material. And that changes the possible wavelengths that the surface plasmon in the metal can have. Not all the wavelengths are going to be available in a small particle as they would be in the bulk, all right? Now, the wavelengths of the light that hits a nanoparticle are often larger than the size of the particles. So, for example, for visible light, the range of available wavelengths is somewhere around 400 nanometers to roughly 700 nanometers. And the nanoparticles that you can purchase from Sigma Aldrich or wherever else, well, those things are tens of nanometers or smaller, okay? So, your wavelength of your light is a lot bigger. So, you can think of it more like this. When the electron cloud is excited, it's being excited by this external wave, okay, so the electric field is coming through, and that creates a distortion in the electron cloud that makes up that surface plasmon, kind of like is depicted here in this cartoon. Now, if it's excited at a resonant frequency for that particular configuration, then the absorption of light and the response of the particle will be very strong. But if it's not excited at its resonant frequency, then it won't absorb much light and not much will happen. And this helps explain why nanoparticles have very specific colors because the light comes in and if it's in tune with the resonant frequency for the surface plasmon, then it gets absorbed and if it's not, then it doesn't, okay? So you can think of a UV visible light spectrum of nanoparticles sort of similarly to the way that you think of um, amplitude versus frequency response curve for a driven oscillator. Remember um, driven oscillators? If you have a system like a kid sitting on a swing and you're pushing the kid, then you're going to get a large amplitude response if you push the kid at the right frequency or rate. If you don't push the kid at the right frequency or rate, then the amplitude response of the system will be teeny. So this is the idea behind a driven oscillator, and it's also kind of the same idea that you see here. If that electromagnetic wave drives the uh, plasmon at the right frequency, you'll get a big response and a large absorption at that frequency. So let's take a look at some UV visible light spectra of these gold nanoparticles, okay? So the size of the nanoparticle is indicated at the top of the set of graphs. So here on the left, the size of the nanoparticle ranges from five nanometers to 40 nanometers. In the middle, it's ranging from 40 nanometers to 100 nanometers. And then here on the right, it goes from 100 to 400, okay? So you'll notice something interesting if you look at these curves. Okay, first of all, in the middle curve, as you change the size of the nanoparticle, as it ranges from 40 nanometers here on the left to 100 nanometers here on the right, you see a shift in the wavelength, okay? So the absorbance of the incident light changes as you change the size of that nanoparticle. And that makes sense if you think about the confinement of that wave to a specific geometry and how that is going to be dictated by the geometry, all right? Now another thing that you notice, and you see this one mostly as you go to the graph on the right, you get a distinct peak, okay, for things that can still be considered to be nanoparticles, you know, 100 nanometers or less. As you start to add size onto your particle and you're getting up to say the 400 nanometer range, which is depicted here in the blue, I believe it's kind of hard to see, or no, the gray here at the bottom. So that's 400 nanometers. Then what you see is you sort of see a flat absorbance. You don't see that peak anymore. And what's happening there is, of course, it's starting to act like, more like a bulk metal. It's absorbing and then re-emitting and reflecting. And it would look shiny, you know, if you could look at it um, with, uh, regular, with your regular eyes. So that's how bulk gold does, right? It absorbs um, and re-emits for all across the spectrum, and it looks shiny. Of course, it's still got some peaks there, and that's why gold has this characteristic gold color as opposed to the silvery color that a lot of other metals do. But you can see my point here. The curve is getting flattened out as you get larger as it tends toward those bulk sizes.
Now it's worth mentioning that not just the size of the nanoparticle, but all the, also the shape can affect the color that you see. So here, these solutions are um, solutions with, uh, or colloids, with, I believe, in water, gold nanoparticles suspended in water. So here up top, um, A through E, you've got spherical nanoparticles, which are changing um, with changing size, okay? So they get, uh, the nanoparticles get larger as you move to the right, okay? And so the color changes. Now, here on the bottom, you've got a sort of pink to green um, and maybe a little bit of orange in there, and that's a different color. It's still gold, it's still nanoparticles, but what's happening is it's changing from more of a spherical shape to more of a long rod cylindrical type shape. And the, the, the longer it gets, it shifts it more towards the green, okay? And that's also affected by what kind of standing waves can be um, formed by the surface plasmons, which is dictated by the geometry of the particle, okay? And so in order to really understand the color response, you would have to have a nice model um, showing all the possible surface plasmons that can be excited, and then seeing which ones form those uh, strong resonance or standing waves when excited by uh, visible light. Okay, so that's how that all works. Now, not just the size, not just the shape, but also the type of metal can affect what colors the nanoparticles are when they're suspended in the solution. So here on the left, those are gold nanoparticles, and here on the right, that's silver nanoparticles, okay? And so there's a dependence not just on the shape and size, but also on the type of material, which kind of makes sense. And that comes from the fact that uh, you can model your plasmon energy sort of semi-classically. And so here's a model of that. Omega P squared is equal to N E squared over M epsilon naught. And here omega P is the plasmon resonance frequency. So that's the uh, frequency that it likes to respond and absorb strongly at. N is the number density of your electrons uh, with units of 1 over cubic meters. E is the charge of an electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. M is the electron mass. 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 newton meters squared per coulomb squared, I think. Um, so an increased electron density, a larger value of N here, is going to cause an increase in your plasmon resonance frequency, and that means it's going to shift towards the blue. So this dependence upon the uh, density of the free electrons helps explain why different materials um, have nanoparticles that are different colors. Of course, different materials have different densities, naturally, a different number of atoms per cubic meter, and then different metals are going to contribute changing numbers of free electrons to the free electron gas, and so that's going to also affect what's going on there. All right, so that's kind of a, a brief overview of why um, the color of nanoparticles changes as you change the size and an explanation of what surface plasmons are. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.